So hello everyone and a very warm welcome to today's webinar. My name is Toby. I will be your host today together with Sarah. I will introduce her in just a second. I'd like to start with the following slide. Um, two weeks ago, we saw a rover land on Mars a few hundred of million of kilometers away. The landing was done automatically without any human intervention because it's just too far away for the radio waves to hit the rover on time. And now this thing is cruising around, again, fully autonomically, and guided by an AI, it collects samples, and it does that, that just without any human intervention. While at the same time, here on Earth, we are doing still manual copy-pasting tasks. I find this very unbelievable. So again, welcome from Sarah and my side. Um, Sarah is a business solution manager at Turicode. She has joined roughly two and a half years ago. She holds a master's degree in English studies and in multilingual text analytics from the University of Zurich. And she helps our customers to automatically process documents. Me, myself, I also studied in Zurich. I hold a master's in banking and finance and I've worked all my life in banking so far and joined Turicode this year. Turicode was founded roughly five years ago, and we are located in Winterthur, Switzerland, and we employ currently around 25 people. Thank you all for filling out the poll. I'm going to quickly show you the results. We see we have a lot of people here from Switzerland, Germany, and Austria, but also some people from the APEC region. And I see, which is very interesting, we have quite a few people that process more than 100 documents per day manually. And I think this is very nice that you're here and you can learn on what you can do to automate this process. What are we going to talk about today? Sarah will start with a short introduction to machine learning. She's going to talk about the definition and history. She will dig into important concepts that if you understand them, you have a broad understanding on what you can achieve with machine learning. Then she's going to tell you how you can build a machine learning model and a very important topic, what quality measures you have to um, take in mind. Me, myself, I'm going to talk about machine learning for documents later on. I will talk about use cases and especially on what kind of documents you can process with our solution. And I will also give you a brief overview what's the difference between OCR and Turicode, and we will end with some case studies. In the very end, you will have the chance to answer, to ask questions. You should see in your Zoom a Q&A or for the German speakers, it's called F and A section where you can um, ask your questions and we will go into these at the very end. You can also ask questions in German if it fits you better. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Sarah. Sarah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So welcome also from my side. Um, so what is machine learning? It's something that um, we all talk about, we've all heard. And Oxford Languages defines it as the follows. Machine learning is the use and development of computer systems that are able to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions by using algorithms and statistical models to analyze and draw inferences from patterns and data. What this means in uh, layman's terms is that the machine learns with exposure to data over time. So just as we all had to learn, well, at least those from Switzerland had to learn French vocabulary um, at school. We get better with time. We get better if we see a word more than once. Basically, that's the same for the machine. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's a very new concept. That's not technically true. Um, the term artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s. Um, they thought it will be solved by the 1960s <laughs> and we'll have a, a truly intelligent um, computer. That is not the case, um, as we all know, but it has been so, it's been around for a very long time and what has what is the difference now that it has actually taken off is that we have a lot more computer power we have a lot more um, data to process 
which makes machine learning better because the more data, the more, the more better, <laughs> which is not grammatically correct, but the more, you know, the more data we have, the more we can learn from, the better the machine gets. And uh, yeah, as you can see here, we started in the 50s and then there was um, different waves of development and now we are in the so so-called deep learning boom where we have a lot of computer power and a lot of data to process. Now, if we continue, the question is where, where is machine learning? And I've had people tell me, well, I've never interacted with machine learning ever before. And as soon as you use Google to search something or you have a spam filter in place, you have interacted with machine learning. Um, then we all know the, the dancing robots. I think we've all seen them before Christmas from Boston Dynamics. There's a lot of intelligence involved in them being able to stand up straight, um, carry out these movements. Then something I think we've all <laughs> been binge, binging on is um, are the different streaming services. So how does Netflix know I would like to watch another uh, trash romance series? <laughs> it is because I've watched them before and they have an algorithm which matches um, the series to my likings. Sometimes there it's better, sometimes it's worse. Um, you know, algorithms are not without fault. And then one, I think, super interesting um, use case are all these uh, intelligent um, assistants where you speak to a, um, a system and it gives you answers. Um, I think with my background in language technology, that's the one where, my, where I'm um, most intrigued on how it works um, exactly. But so, the gist of it is that machine learning is everywhere. We use it daily. Sometimes we know that we use it, sometimes we don't, but it is around us. And I think it's good to understand some basics. So that's what we're gonna do. I wanna talk about three important concepts. So rule-based versus machine learning based um, systems. Then what is the whole supervised versus unsupervised? Um, talk about and then the different types of machine learning and how and when to use them. So rule-based. As the name implies, you have to define rules um, for the machine to carry out. So if we were going to be super healthy today, all the examples that I'm talking about <laughs> are about fruits because it's something everyone can visualize and it's easy to explain with. So if we're trying to categorize fruit, if we do it rule-based, we say, well, if the color is red, it's an apple. If the color is yellow, it's a banana. If it's anything but red or, uh, red or yellow, it's any other fruit. We could also re refine these rules. We could say, well, if it's red and round, it is an apple, or if it's yellow and longish, it's an apple. But then what do you do if you have like a yellow carrot? it all of a sudden becomes a, a banana because it fits the yellow and long description, right? And rule base can be extremely powerful if the categories are simple, but it requires a programmer or someone who knows the field of fruits or whatever you want to uh, work on extremely well. And then on the machine learning side, the system learns from examples. And you can think of that as um, with a little kid who learns, you know, what is a dog and what is a cat and what is a tree and whatever else. So you show the, the system examples of apples and bananas and it learns from that. This does not really require an expert. Um, you need someone to know what your categories, but that's about it. And, but <laughs> as I said, rule base is super powerful, but machine learning can also be very powerful because it is more flexible. If in the rule base, something doesn't fit a rule, the system breaks. Machine learning is more adaptable to uncertainty, basically as, as, we, um, as we are as humans. So that's the first big distinction um, you can get very far with rule-based. Sometimes it's the best approach, 
But as soon as it gets more complex, machine learning makes a lot more sense. Now we are in the realm of machine learning and we are talking about unsupervised and supervised learning. And again, I have a, an example with fruit. So supervised means you tell the algorithm what it's supposed to be learning. You have input data, you have annotations, and you say, well, this input data, input data is um, apples. Then we train a model. We show it a new unseen image in this case. And the prediction is, well, it is an apple, I'm pretty sure. So we've shown um, examples of what something looks like. And now if we show the model a banana, it will say, well, not an apple for sure. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's not an apple. On the other hand, we have the unsupervised where the algorithm finds its own patterns. So there's a lot more training data or a lot more data involved usually um, because I need a lot of examples to be able to decide what category something is supposed to, um, supposed to be. So again, we have input data. In this case, we added peaches to make it a bit more interesting. The model decides for itself, what sort of categories do I see? And when we show it an apple, it may come to the conclusion that this must belong to the bottom category here, um, an apple. But the machine doesn't really know it's an apple. It just knows it looks the same as all the other round red thingies looked like. Um, with the unsupervised approach, sometimes you get interesting results. And I think that's best explained if you think of Lego bricks. So you can order Lego bricks according to color. You can also order them according to how many knobs are on top. You can order them according to length or width or, you know, shape, whatever. And if you just let the machine decide what it should order um, for, the results may surprise you. They may also be extremely perfect, but they may surprise you. Something to keep in mind when working with unsupervised um, systems. Exactly. Now we have a lightweight, so we have different types of machine learning. We can say, we have lightweight machine learning. These are usually used for simple tasks. So um, for example, categorizing two types of documents, um, it requires a smaller training set because it's simple. It has fast running times and it can run on any laptop. Um, there's different algorithms that can be used within um, this tasks. Some of them um, like naive base are based on very simple um, probability ideas. Let's put it this way. <laughs> and these lightweight machine learning, they get you very far. But as soon as you have a data set, which is very diverse, so you don't just have European trees, but you also have all the trees in the Amazon jungle, it gets a bit more complicated. And then deep learning can be your best friend. It is best suited to complex tasks. So when there is a lot of different looking data, you need a big training set, or you can use something called transfer learning um, to come back to French vocabulary. So if you've learned French, you might be able to understand some Italian, or if you learned Italian, you will definitely understand some Spanish. So you can transfer your knowledge from one language to the other. You can also do that with machine learning um, tasks. What is the downside sometimes with deep learning is that it has a lot longer training times. We're not talking about seconds or minutes, but hours and or days, depending on how powerful your server is. And it requires a GPU. So my laptop will not do. You will have to have um, some powerful GPU so that you don't have to wait for weeks, but just days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And then what you see down here is a typical image of a neural network, um, which is considered within the deep learning um, area. And as you can see, it's a lot, it's complex because you have an input layer and then um, the machine decides for itself how it navigates through these hidden layers. And at the end, you have an output. Let's say it's a banana or it's an apple. Exactly. So now the question is how do I actually do or build a machine learning model? Well, first, it's you need a training data set. And I cannot stress this enough. It is important that your training data looks like the data you want to process. Um, as an example, if you train a machine learn a machine translation system, so like Google Translate, for example, but you train it on legal texts, it is it works perfectly well on legal texts. But if you try to um, translate a text about football or soccer, it will go very wrong, <laughs> or the, the results will be super interesting, just because there's a vocabulary the system has never seen, there's sentence structure the system has never seen. So it is important that your training data reflects your actual everyday production data, so the data you actually will process through the system. Then you will have to select a algorithm that is usually done well, in the case of Turicode, it's usually done by us because we know what works best on what documents. Um, but it is important that you find an algorithm that actually solves your problem. Um, people, I often say, well, it's important to, you know, select the right tool for your problem. And then you train on your data. And at the end, you have a model which you can use on new and unseen data to process your your documents or your pictures or you know my personal preferences on netflix something like that and exactly and those are the three basic steps to build a machine learning model for you to use the question now we often get is well what about quality how do i know my system does what i want it to do and how do i know it does it well one quality measure you can take is the F1 score. It's very widely used and it is the harmonic mean between precision and recall. What this means is that it punishes you if you only find one, but this is correct, but it also punishes you if you find everything and a thousand more which are wrong. In the case of the fruit basket um, on your right, we have been looking for apples and if, we, if I find just one apple, uh, my precision is very high, but the recall is very low. If I find all the apples plus the peach and the plum and an orange, my precision will go down, but my recall will be high. So it, sometimes the use case can be that we need a very high precision. I need what we find to be correct. I don't care if we don't find any, everything, but what I find has to be correct. And sometimes, it is okay if I don't find, if I find more than I actually want. So again, here, the quality measure is, is different depending on your goal um, that you have. Exactly. So with that, I think I'm already coming to an end of the, of our very short introduction to machine learning. So as we've seen, May I real quick? Sorry, Toby. <laughs> As we've seen, machine learning is everywhere. Um, machine learning is a toolbox, so make sure that you choose something that fits your problem. So don't try to hammer in um, a screw, but use a screwdriver for the screw and the hammer for the nail. And data is key. So garbage in, garbage out is a big motto in machine learning. Make sure that what you feed into your system is what you want out of your system. And with that, I'll gladly hand over to Toby. I'll be answering all questions uh, afterwards in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very helpful indeed. Um, 
it's the problem is that I'm now a little more hungry and um, with all the fruits that we've seen. So um, yeah, let's just continue. Um, I think you have now seen that the basic concepts, but um, how can we apply all that stuff that we've learned from Sarah on documents? Right, let's dig into this. Um, why do we need machine learning on documents? So a statement that we often hear when talking to our clients is, yeah, we are fully digitized. All of our documents are saved as PDFs, wonderful. I mean, that's of course, that's great. It's, it's already better than having a lot of physical documents uh, in your drawer somewhere. But when you have a PDF, data is locked in the document and it's not possible to work with such data. Think about um, when you want to, to calculate the sum of some numbers in different documents, you cannot do that with a PDF. You need that stuff in Excel. So someone needs to find the right document, they need to open the document, and they need to copy data into another system to further process it. And the next question is, how do we use machine learning with documents? Sarah has shown you this example with a supervised learning system where we gave the, where we, where we've given the system a couple of apples with a label, that's an apple, that's also an apple, and the third one is definitely also an apple. But how can we do that with documents? We basically just replace the apples with documents. And this applies for both supervised and unsupervised learnings. The, the interesting thing is here, because it's an apple, we, we were talking about images before. So in a document, of course, you not only have the image layer, but you can also go much more in depth. We'll, we will show you that later on. So we basically see two different areas on where you can use machine learning on documents. Very broadly defined, the first one is document classification. The second one is data extraction. With document classification, we basically mean bring order to chaos. You have a lot of documents that come in to, you, to your uh, company via email, via upload from customers. You have them on a server somewhere, but you don't know exactly what it is. So the first step is to find out what exactly this type of document is. For example, as you can see on the left, we can classify documents into two types, into pension certificates and bank statements. That's already very helpful because then you can further process data later on, as you can see on the right. Namely, the second part is data extraction. So from a pension certificate, you definitely want to find other data than you want to find in a bank statement. In a pension certificate, you probably want to find out the name um, of this person, the date of birth, some social security information, and also some line items like how much money does this person has for his retirement. On a bank statement, you probably want to find out what bank is this coming from, again, what's the name of the customer, and then maybe all the bookings, like when did this person withdraw money from an ATM, when did this person do a payment in Coop to buy a sandwich, etc. So that's probably the two ways we can use machine learning for documents, classification and data extraction. If we jump to the next slide, this is also a question that we get very often. What is the difference between OCR and Turicode? So basically between OCR and what we do. Because um, it is very, it's honestly very hard to, to understand if you're not working with that every day. OCR, as you can see on the left, is optical character recognition. In plain English, it turns pixels into text. Think about working in your office. You have a document you need to scan that came in via post. You put that stuff on a scanner and send, you, send yourself an email, you receive a PDF. But what happens in between? So first, the scanner does a scan. That's basically just taking a photo of the document. This document then goes into an OCR engine and it looks at all the different pixels, as you can see there, this A on the left, and, and the, the OCR engine figures out, well, that's probably going to be an A. It does that with all the, the the letters and in the end you receive a searchable PDF into your email inbox. But that's only where we with our solution start or where you can start with using machine learning on documents. In our system you input the PDF and a first step is, use, is usually OCR and then we do quite a, a few things. We analyze these documents on a very granular level. 
So in the end, we find a lot of different attributes. We find words, we find paragraphs, images, positions of such words, tables, font sizes, etc. This gives us a, a very clear understanding of the document. What we do here is probably best summarized with semantics. What do I mean with that? Think about our CEO's name. It's Martin Keller. Keller in uh, English means seller. So if you find in a document the word seller or Keller, this can be either a place in your house or a name. So if we apply semantics and we can find out whether this word Keller in a document is rather a place in a house or rather a name of a customer. What comes out from our system then is a, a clear understanding of a document, its structure and its content. We had a very nice comment recently on LinkedIn by one of our customers from Renus, Alexander Kercher, and he, I think the first sentence says it all. I would rather say first there was OCR, then there came to recode. That's exactly how we see ourselves. And um, I also find the rest of the quote very interesting. Um, it eliminates mindless work that no one likes and it, the people using a, a machine learning solution for document documents, they are able to focus on what's important and not on boring copy-pasting tasks. You've seen now that we can use um, machine learning to classify documents, but also to extract data from such documents. I think we have two very nice case studies here that show you exactly how this can be applied in real life. On the left, I'd like to first jump into Vertile. Vertile is a, is a very big, heavy industry company. They produce engines and parts for engines for, for large boats, oil tankers, stuff like that. And they wanted to strengthen their customer relations and just be a little more responsive. So Vertile receives over 40,000 pages per year of purchase orders and requests for quotations. This means a, a big shipping company tells them we would ha we have to fix our engine and we need these seven things. And they send a document to Vertile and the customer account manager. They usually then open this document and find, figure out exactly what they want, what the customer wants, which seven parts they want and how expensive they are. But now Vertile has automated this process. So every incoming document gets classified automatically and data gets extracted so that they can use an automated tool to respond to the customers very fast with a quote on the specific parts that customer wants to receive. And one of the operations managers at Vertile put it very nicely. We can now process purchase orders and requests for quotations around the globe in real time. So they don't have a backlog. They don't need anyone just to copy and paste data into another system so that someone else can process the data. It's just done in the back with our solution. On the right, we have a case study from Allianz. That's Allianz Immobilien in Switzerland. Um, Allianz is a big insurer. They have, um, they have to invest their money. And so they own a pretty large real estate portfolio. And their goal was to do a CO2 study based on the energy consumption of these buildings. Now, the first and probably yeah, the, the, the logic approach would have been to go into every such building, install a smart meter, wait one year, you have a lot of data and you can do an analysis on that. But what Allianz decided to do is they approached us and discussed together with us what could be done in, with existing documents. Because in their um, ERP, they have a lot of bills, energy bills, which are historically collected and, and archived. But from these energy bills, they only extract where they have to pay the money and how much they have to pay. So there's a lot of hidden data in, this energy, in these energy bills. So we helped them to classify and extract over 6,000 energy bills. They do that every year now. So it's, uh, again, a, re a recurring business. And they have 96 different energy suppliers. And all the bills, as you can imagine, they look very different. So we cannot just uh, apply a template on these bills, but we have to really understand the documents. From these bills, the, we can extract information such as um, when did how much energy, when was how much energy consumed and which type of energy was this? Was this solar powered energy or what other kind of energy? And with the structured data, Allianz can then do a, a big CO2 analysis. 
And they obtain, of course, significantly better results compared, compared to manual processing because they haven't even had the data before and they would have to hire a couple of students or, or interns to type in all the data from the bills. You can find more interesting case studies on our website. And we have other for, uh, case studies from other industries available as well, like for example, from um, the Stadt Archiv Zürich. Now we have seen two specific type of documents before, energy bills and purchase orders from Verzile. Because Turicode already exists for five years, we've come along or come across a lot of different document types. And as I have told you before, um, we're not, we not specialized in one specific document type, but we can process basically anything. So we have seen also interesting applicances in, with salary statements, where a, a bank uses our software to extract up to 40 data points per salary st statement. They would otherwise have to type in manually into a system. We also process invoices and tax declarations for, for logistics companies, etc. So basically, I think that the, the most important point on this slide is the last one, it's etc. We know very we, we know a lot of different document types that we have seen, and we can process them. You've already seen basically the, the, the message of this slide in, in, the, in the quote of the um, Alexander from Renus before, but what are the benefits of automated document processing? I think these three bullets summarize it very nice. First, saving time and money. Using a machine to extract data from documents is, is just cheaper and it's much, much, much faster. Because usually when you upload a document into a system, it takes, I would say, between one and five seconds, depending on, on, the, on the document size, to get extracted data out of it. And a, a person would usually need several minutes to type out the data. The second point is even more important because employees are usually happier if they don't have to waste hours and hours per week with manual copy-pasting data. If you get the data already in a structured way, you can uh, focus more time with your clients, you can spend more time with your clients, or you can focus your attention on analyzing the data. And the third point already also very important is um, you can get better data quality because the system just doesn't get tired. So a person typing in data very late at night is probably already tired and uh, makes mistakes, but the machine doesn't do that. It just works on 24-7. Now, before we jump into the, the Q&A section, what will change for you if you start using Turicode? On the left side, I've depicted our approach. So we, we are certain that the business knowledge is with you, and you also have to stay in control of the process. So you, as, for example, someone working for a bank, you are, you are the expert when it comes to content of the documents you know much better what's inside the salary statement and which information you need than we do. So we only provide a technical tool that you can easily access your data. The second point, you stay in control of the process is also very important. With our tool, you are very flexible regarding the input. So you can send in a PDF into the, the system or an image, you can send in an email. So totally flexible on when it comes to input. But also on the other side, when it comes to output, the, our, our tool is very flexible. You can either download an Excel, you can download any other type of, of file, or you can directly in, output the data into another system, such as SAP, for example, or Avalok um, if you're a bank. And it's very flexible to extend. It can be done by yourself. You can easily train new documents on our system, and you can also easily extend what data points get extracted. So our proposition or our aim is basically that you as a customer should be able to easily set up your machine learning model within minutes. I think that's very important. It's a very quick and easy tool to use, and you can improve and extend the model on the job. So it gets better over time, because if you find an error, for example, in one document, that happens, of course, from time to time, you can just relabel the document and use it again to make the model a little, a little better. 
uh, you have no limitations in terms of languages and document types, as I already told you before. And because of our vast experience, you, you can um, benefit from first-class service with pre-trained models and our know-how. And with that, I'd like to open for the, the Q&A section. And we will do it as follows. You can still use the Q&A section in, um, in Zoom. And I'm going to ask the question. Sarah will answer them as good as possible. <laughs> and let's see what we already have here. So one question we have in the chat is, uh, can you briefly discuss some of the pre-trained models to recode offers? Maybe Sarah? Yeah, so I can briefly discuss it. <laughs> um, we have some pre-trained models, um, for example, on salary statements. But the, um, yeah, so there we have a, a model which a lot of people or like multiple customers can um, profit from. Um, but usually um, client requests or expectations of a system are very specific to a certain company. So we have some very similar models, but also, but always with a little specificity uh, to a certain client. So while, and, but we are in the process of getting more and more of these general pre-trained pre models. I hope this answers the question. I think so, yes. Thank you very much. Um, and another question is, um, how do you train a model with the, the solution from Turicode? How, what do you need to do? Because you cannot, only, you cannot just come to our offices in Wintertour and show us some apples. I think that's not possible. <laughs> but how do you train such a model? Exactly. Uh, while we do like apples, we like documents better. Um, so basically, we need to know what data points um, a client is interested in. And we have a look at some example data um, documents usually. And then um, there's two ways. One, there is historical data which we can pro profit from. So we have a PDF and the structured output. And we can reverse label them and thus create or automatically create a training set. In the second case, someone needs to annotate um, the documents. This can be done very easily uh, via our UI. Um, you basically need to know how to use a mouse and you can train a machine learning system with us. It is very easy. And I think it's important to note that we have invested a lot of time to make sure that you don't need a thousand training documents, but a lot less so that you don't have to spend I don't know, a month or two on labeling data, but you can label maybe two days and you have a working system um, that can extract data. Okay. And maybe this goes in a little bit in the same direction, but can, uh, can you also use the system with uh, handwriting? Because we have seen now bank statements that looked like a pretty neat and clear PDF. And we have seen... Um, purchase orders that could that's usually maybe a word or, or a pdf as well but how does it look with handwriting and maybe also with with photos yeah so photos we can process uh, i mean as long as the the angle is not completely weird but there's some limitation to that but mostly we can process it um handwriting um is a difficult topic it is um icr is called intelligent character recognition and we have some experiences with numbers. We have um, uh, two projects, one for the University of Zurich and one for the Children's Hospital in Zurich, where we process um, handwritten numbers. But the quality is a lot less, or is, is not as good as with um, conventional typed um, scripture. But I mean, it will take some time and with numbers we're doing okay, but handwriting as such, as in, you know, love letters, it will remain difficult for, I would say the next two or three years. Okay. It's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I've seen in the chat another, another question. Um, 
so I think this this basically goes in the same direction. The question is, where does Turicode still has potential and what are your biggest challenges to get even better? I think one of that is has already been answered, but that's not what we do with, with understanding handwritten documents. But I think hand, handwriting is something that, that, is, that we get asked about a lot. Exactly. It's still something we can, we can uh, Im improve a little. Exactly. I think what uh, is um, one of the next bigger topics that we will tackle is um, expanding our workflow tools so that we can cover, so that we can give the, our clients the power to cover their whole process or document process and make sure that they are in control of the process. And then, as I said, we are working on more shared models. Um, we, there's always new and interesting challenges coming up. Um, yeah, we'll have Perfect. to see. Thanks. Um, so we, I, there is one question that I think we already put to answer, although we did not answer it. I'll answer that real quick. The mm -hmm. question was, um, what are the first step and requirements to start using machine learning on documents? Mm -hmm. so in our case, we you need to have a digitized version of that document, so a scan, um, a PDF, but it can, we can also process Excel or emails, for example. And then it makes, uh, and then you can get started. So the, the hurdle is not very high, <laughs> let's put it this way. But, but of course you need a certain amount of volume. It doesn't make sense if you see one document um, once a month and it takes you 10 seconds to process this, it probably not, it doesn't make sense to use machine learning on that. But as soon as you spend a lot of time repeatedly on a certain type of document, it makes sense in my opinion to, to get started with machine learning. Perfect, thanks. Um, for the next question, maybe we can, we can dig into this one a little. And um, one question is, the machine does the machine does the machine still work at full capacity if the documents aren't in English or German? I've touched on that already a little, but maybe you can can explain a little further. Yeah, so it does. Um, obviously, if we see a document for the first time in French, we might have some um, some difficulties, or you know, we're not perfect, but it will get. We can process basically any language. And then in parentheses, <laughs> currently we're doing best at, uh, at things that are written from uh, left to right and not right to left. Um, but we've also processed um, Chinese documents. As long as we can OCR and understand or the machine understands the characters, um, then it doesn't really matter what language a, a document is in. Okay. And as I said, with the, with the training set, right, it is important that if you know that you have documents in, let's say, in Switzerland, in German, French, Italian, and English, that your training set contains these four languages. Yeah, so it's, again, basically as if, you, if a human looks the first time at the document, if you don't know any French, it's going to be hard even to recognize what kind of document you're processing. Exactly. Sometimes, you know, if it's the exact same document, so if we think of a, a um, Sunrise mobile phone invoice, it doesn't look very different French and German, I assume, but it had the, the words at the beginning of the, the line are a bit different. And so this is less of a problem um, than if it's a completely different document. Okay, thanks. Um... Then we have one, when should one upgrade from existing OCR to machine learning? As soon as you are fed up with copy pasting. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, I think it's, I think um, it makes sense that as soon as OCR is not enough, right? As soon as it's not enough to just be able to um, do a search in a document, as soon as it's not, as, you, as soon as you spend too much time on copy pasting or um, stuff like that uh, instead of the, the actual, your actual job, right? Usually our actual job is not copy pasting but making sense of the data I'm inputting into a system. So I think as soon as you have a certain workload 
that you dedicate to dealing with these documents, um, it makes sense to to automate the process as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And we have three more questions. One of them I think I'm going to answer myself. It's a little longer one. And the question is, do you already have any interface with other storage system? And then the question goes on. Um, can you process data that is stored, for example, in Microsoft SharePoint? The, the quick answer there is yes, we can. As I told you before, we are very flexible when it comes to how data comes into our tool. So we can scan a folder or, for example, SharePoint, which is basically also like a folder on steroids. And we can get data out from there. Uh, the question goes on and it, it goes on in how can we compare data that has been extracted, for example, from a passport document? Can we compare that to another database that we have? So that's also possible. It needs some customization from our side, but we have done that. Uh, we do that regularly. And this will be, I think, also um, the way to go forward to integrate automatically where you can get data from to do some cross checks. Maybe if I can jump in here, mm -hmm. we've seen the Vapsila case, right? Yeah. There we do some basic checks in their, um, in their database. So we check the article number we extracted against the article number they have in their system. If the article number is not um, there, for example, a human has to look at it. So that would be one example where we, where we check data against um, database from, against a database from a client. Wonderful, thanks. Um, I think we're going to end then with the, 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 the funny one. So, but first the serious one, how does the licensing model look like? Um, yeah, so we are a classical software as a service company. So usually there is a implementation fee where we set up your system to your liking. Um, and then the pricing model is volume based. So you usually, or our clients usually know roughly about how many documents um, or pages they process per week, uh, per month or per year. And we come, yeah, you know, we set up a price uh, for that amount that you think you will process. Wonderful, perfect, thanks. And I think the last question here, um, I, I assume you have a funny story for that one. Um, what is the most <laughs> surprising model or use case you've seen so far? I don't know if a model has been very surprising, but I think the content of documents sometimes is very interesting. So we had a, a case with um, the Stadtarchiv Zürich, the Stadtarchiv Zürich, and there we have processed um, index cards for um, some social um, justice or social Jugendamt in German. I can't think of the name in, in English right now. And there, there's always on these cards, there's always the reason on why people were placed um, with the Jugendamt or why they had some sort of intervention in their childhood. And I think some of these reasons are very shocking today. <laughs> like I remember that one kid was let go out of the system because it was deemed a lost cause. And that's just very interesting. <laughs> and I think in all these historical data, there is very, uh, we had census data where they collected information about um, the mental status of, of uh, citizens in each town and uh, the labels for these mental statuses was it's not politically correct anymore today so I think that those are the like not as such as the the, the model or the use case is what is um, most surprising or interesting but it's content if you get to look at it <laughs> exactly very interesting thanks and um, yeah I think with that thank you all very much for all these brilliant questions and um, I didn't expect so much to come um, but it was all, all very good and, and very interesting indeed and um, thanks for for tuning in today and um, if you have any further 
questions, please feel free to contact us. You should have my email address in your inbox because of the registration. We also offer free data extraction audits. So just hit us up, uh, send us some sample documents and we can discuss together what makes most sense for you and how and what we could automate. And uh, with that, thanks again from my side and from Sarah's side as well. Enjoy your lunch and have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you very Thank you. much. Goodbye.